Um, as I said, we're talking to you about David. Um, David is one of the most prominent figures in the Bible. When you list when, when you list the major players in the Bible, how many of you would list David up there? You, you probably have Jesus, Peter, James, John, Paul, and you, Moses, Noah. Adam, David. You might throw in Isaiah or, you know, or, uh, you know, whoever stands out at you, you know, maybe Ruth, Esther, a couple female powerful figures. <clears throat> but David is one of the ones that make the list because of what God did in his life. And, um, and the, the, the giant story that we shared with you two weeks ago, we had a Holy Ghost service last week, but um, in, the, in the previous message, two weeks ago, we shared a, we talk, called it a giant story. And just with that theme, I wanted to kind of stick with that. So we're con- going to call this a king story. And the giant story happened after what sets the stage for the king story. And so, uh, so let's go back to the beginning in David's life where we see a tale of God's choice for Israel's king. How many of you know they demanded, as we said a couple weeks ago, I want a king, and they got their king. God told them, you really don't. But they wanted one, and he says, okay. You're not going to like it. And they got what, they, what he warned them about. So, uh, so he picked the replacement. And... Uh, we're going to pick up in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 1. I wish I had time to go over. I'm real concerned because like, my time in the Word, I've had to really have it focused and I've prayed for it to be quality because the quantity, you know, with the, with the hours that I'm putting in with the work and the, the challenge. Um, you all don't know this. I guess uh, you wouldn't know this, but my... Um, training that's supposed to be done July 31st. They told us uh, the beginning of the week that um, it's expanded. It won't be done till October the 11th. They expanded the training, um, and uh, and so it's going to be 10 months of training instead of <laughs> uh, <coughs> seven and a half months of training. And um, and so uh, and that really kicks into gear a week from tomorrow. But um, we're going to do some already some new stuff and it's like well, that's going to be in some, it's like Lord I got to have quality time and he's really honoring it so I get in there and it's and that's why some of this stuff just comes out because it's just rich and it's illuminated and I'm about to read some scripture and that's going to want to happen and you all know me I'm a teacher of the Word. and So let's just try to see if we can go through without being here till 1. <laughs> um, or noon, I guess. Uh, and get the big big idea. Um, 1 Samuel, chapter... i tell you what, let me um, do something here and get myself set up here. Okay, I can read this a little easier this way. 1 Samuel 16.1 Now the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Saul sinned. We'll leave it at that. Fill your horn with oil and go. I am sending you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided myself a king among his sons. Saul was the king that Israel provided and presented to the Lord. And he was a royal failure. Who did that? Was that you, Jane? Bless you. I got a giggle at least. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. It was a royal failure. King Saul. Okay. So, um, So he says, Fill your horn with oil. And go to Jesse the Bethlehemite. 
And amongst his sons, out of his sons, I have provided, I have provided a king for myself. And we see a little picture of uh, Saul is being told to do. Take the horn of oil to anoint him. So you see young David, the shepherd, with some sheep in that. Hello? (laughs) The picture, okay. You see young David and that horn full of oil um, to go over David's head and anoint him. And so... Um, and he's, you see him depicted accurately as being young and adolescent, and uh, there's his brothers off in the, in the sheep. But how, did he, how does he get to David? Let's quickly read through this passage. So it was when they came, verse uh, 6, that they, when, they, when they came that he looked at Eli of the sons. So Jesse and his sons came before Samuel. When he arrives, he says, go get your sons and bring them before me. So he's out in the yard and they bring him. And when they came, he looked at Eliab, the eldest. And he said, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. That's the same problem they had when they picked Saul, wasn't it? Saul looked the part. He was a head taller than the tallest man in Israel, remember? But that didn't, that didn't matter. And Samuel, anointed as he is, sees Eliab and it's like, surely this is the Lord's anointed. We need to stop looking at the outward. Amen? Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature because I have refused him. Don't look at the outward things. God can use any of us. He actually specializes in that. i got to keep moving. For the Lord does not see as man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. What does the Lord look at? That's what He's looking at. I like how Lisa dotted the I when she got up here and said, it's the heart. Whatever it is that you need to yield, yield that, but it's give your heart to worshiping the Lord. And it was the perfect conclusion, topper of it. So, um, Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shammah pass by. And he said, neither has the Lord chosen <coughs> this one. Thus Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen these. And Samuel said to Jesse, are are all the young men here? Then he said, now listen to what uh, what, uh, Jesse says to Samuel. Then he, Jesse says, there remains yet the youngest, and there he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes. God's going to have his way. And there's a big thing happening here and I can't get into all the detail of it because my sermon got reduced from a good 50 minutes to uh, 15. <clears throat> well, actually less because a little bit about the job thing. Um, so verse 12. So he sent and brought him. Now he was ruddy with bright eyes and good looking. He, 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 he just... He just was that guy, he just sees life. You, you know what I'm talking about? When we say they have bright eyes. They're just, they're, they're like seeing life. But ruddy. Just, you know, um, <coughs> just, just a boy. A boy's boy. <coughs> but he was good looking. And the Lord said, <coughs> Arise, anoint him. Say it with me. For this is the one. And when God makes a decision, you know it's right. And I'm going to tell you something. We're going to see today, because God led me when I talk about the king story, I could picked out so many things and made a whole series on just the kingly aspect of David. But um, I'm going to show you what he showed me. But 
this is the one. Because God's led me to say God can choose imperfect vessels and use imperfect vessels. That's the big idea of today. This is the one. Anoint Him. Everybody say anoint. So we were praying for, as we worship, a fresh anointing. So important. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him. In the midst of his brothers, in the midst of all these who looked the part more than he did, um, he anointed David in the midst of his brothers. And after he anointed him, what happened? The Spirit of the Lord came upon David. Say it with me. From that day forward. So Samuel did his part, arose and went to Ramah. He didn't hang out, didn't stay to train him, didn't stay to watch over him. I, I did what I'm supposed to do. He's in God's hands. You know what David did? He returned to the sheep. But now he's anointed. God chose him because of his character. We're going to see that in the next two weeks. But as he went and just tended those sheep, at one point a bear came and he slew that bear under the anointing of the Lord. He trusted in God. He may have had a confession of faith. Lord, You have given me this responsibility to tend these sheep. I know I am anointed to be the King of Israel. I am anointed as the King of Israel right now. Because the anointing that comes from the Lord is the one that counts. Saul had the anointing lift from him. David had the... And, and Samuel was mourning that. He gets sent to David. So who is in God's eyes the king of Israel now? David. But David has to have his season of preparation. Jesus didn't begin his ministry until he was 30 years old. And until after he was anointed. The miracles didn't start. Because we're dependent on the anointing. That's where the power is. That is the power. It's the Holy Spirit upon us. And David may have said, you've given me this. I'm not doing that yet. So now I've got I've to finish this season and I've got to do this well. I've got to be faithful in these few things over these few sheep before I can be ruler over Israel. And there's this bear here to threaten those sheep. I need you, Lord. And he slew that bear. And then he continues to watch over the sheep and then a lion comes. And I'm sure he had a confession of faith and prayer and called upon the Lord's help. He trusted in the Lord. And the Lord, under that anointing, gave him an ability to slay that. These were God's preparation. This was His preparation time where He can face obstacles in faith and see God bring the deliverance and the victory. They prepared Him for Goliath that we learned about next week. Last uh, two weeks ago. So He sent and brought, verse 12, He sent and brought Him in. And now he was ruddy with bright eyes and good looking. The Lord said, Arise. Oh, I, I, I read you that one, right? So, um, so we see that. So now I, I was wondering where that screen, it was doubled up. I was wondering where the picture was. There's the picture. <laughs> he went back and as he tended this, the sheep, he had time alone with God. Anybody remember what happened with Saul? After he got saved? He had a period of time here where he went off and had some preparation time. He immediately began to convince and talk about Jesus, but then he went off. 
There's something valuable about that. And David did that, and he had his time in worshiping. He had his time, and I can tell you, that comes out in the Psalms. When you start to really understand and learn of the life of David, you'll see these experiences as they're poetically coming out in the Psalms. Okay, got to speed it up rapidly. It came after this that David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up to Judah? What has happened is that um, after a period of time, David comes in to his role to become the king of Israel. Goliath occurs. He's playing his harp before Saul and all kinds of stuff's going on. And then he's, it's time for him to... Uh, he's anointed to, to be the king. Um, in, in Judah to begin with. So it says, David inquired of the Lord, shall I go up to any of the cities of Judah? And the Lord said to him, go up. And David said, where shall I go? He said, to Hebron. So David went up there and, and, and his two wives also, Ahinoam, the Jezreelitess, and Abigail, the widow of Nabal, the Carmelite. And there's so many stories in David's life that, that Abigail won and Nabal is interesting. David brought up the men who were with him, every man with his household, so they dwelt in the cities of Hebron. Then the men of Judah came, and and there they anointed David king over the house of Judah. Now, God's already anointed him. He's He's the king of Israel. But in the natural, this is coming out. And, uh, and so, seven and a half years, he's doing some things, and then, he says, shall I go in? And he's got a group of mighty, they, call, they became known as his mighty men, but he says, shall I go in? And they all go in, and they're dwelling there, and then the people of Judah anointed him to be their king. And that, that was a large portion of the land, Judah. Okay, And so um, they anointed him to be king over the house of Judah. And they told David, saying, the men of Jabesh-Gilead were the ones who buried Saul. So David sent messengers to the men of Jabesh Gilead and said to them, You are blessed of the Lord, for you have shown kindness to your Lord, to Saul, and have buried him. And now may the Lord show kindness and truth to you. I will also repay you this kindness, because you have done this thing. Now therefore let your hands be strengthened, be valiant, for your master Saul is dead, and also the house of Judah has anointed me king over them. So he's immediately beginning reconciliation and trying to bring in people who... Uh, were faithful to Saul. Um, I want to just very quickly, I can't elaborate on it, but I'll let you see a map just to see Judah. And if you see Judah, the yellow part, can you see that and read the word Judah in there pretty easily? Um, you'll look above, um, the land was divided, there was Judah and then there was Israel. And at this point, he's anointed to be king over Judah, that yellow port part, but Israel hasn't recognized him as king at this point. And they've got other people they've made king in Saul's stead. And, it was a, and there were issues, and we don't have time for the history of it. But there, you see Judah and Israel. And you'll see surrounding these other nations. Philistia, that's the land of the Philistines, to the left of Judah, and Moab, and Edom, and Ammon, and Aram, and all of these Arab nations. And the Philistines got back to where they were really, you know, causing a lot of problem and that's what moved David to become a, a, a battling warrior king and have a mighty man and he's dealing with these Philistines and, and so then he says shall I go up to Judah you know where do I go shall I go up to Judah and the Lord says go up and that's where we just picked up so he's now king over, over anointed king over and recognized over Judah and then um, just jumping ahead first, first Chronicles 12 38 through 40 all these, all these men of war who could keep ranks said to came to Hebron with a loyal heart to make King David king over all of Israel because all this battling going on and David's having some success and so people from Israel come and all the rest of Israel were of one mind to make David king and they were there with David three days eating and drinking for their brethren had prepared for them moreover those who were near to them from as far away as Issachar and Zebulon and Naphtali were bringing food and donkeys and camels, mules and oxen, provision of flour and cakes and and, uh, figs and cakes of raisins, wine and oil, and oxen and sheep abundantly. For there was joy in Israel. And then it happened one evening that David arose from his bed 
and walked. Oh, no, wait a minute. I'm, I, I'm sorry. Uh, I didn't. I didn't have it in there. I must have cut a verse short. Um, it's probably verse 41. Um, where he they, Then they anointed him. They had this three-day thing, and they anoint him over all of Israel. So Israel and Judah are now one nation. Because these other guys just were messing up, and they're like, enough of this. Here's this anoint this guy. We can see this anointing. He's beating these Philistines off and having all these victories, and we're having nothing but trouble internally and externally. Um, let's let's get with the program. And and we have that happen. People come in late. Okay. Um, now the next period of David's life, uh, he's king, and he has a heart for God, and he's doing some great things. And and I really don't have time to read the whole story. But I know every one of you know of the story. Um, and you can go home and make it a homework assignment to read from 2 Samuel chapter 11 and, and see this story because I have, you know, a number of scriptures. But David is uh, looking out from his royal por- porch now. This is into his, his reign. And he sees a woman bathing. Um, now there's all kinds of different commentaries on this whole thing. Um, it's David's fault. It's Bathsheba's fault. In Ezekiel chapter 18, it says over and over again, the soul that sin. I'm going to talk King James to you because that's what I cut my teeth as a Christian on. And, and I love the, po- the, the way it sounds, the poetry of it. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. You know, New King James says, the soul that sins, it shall die. Over and over again. One of the most profound chapters in the Bible. Personal responsibility. Bathsheba was at fault. David was at fault. That's my opinion on the (laughs) matter. And the soul that sinneth it shall die. And uh, we know the story. She's bathing naked in view of him. He sees her, sends for her, sleeps with her. She conceives. He has her husband, she's married, has her husband murdered, you know, so he's responsible. Because when you conspire, you hire a hitman, you've committed murder, and you will be tried for murder. They didn't hire a hitman, but he created the situation militarily to have Uriah die. Okay? And, uh, and that did happen, and he was an, Uriah was an honorable person. But he died, and uh, David married her, Bathsheba. And um, they had a baby, and they had that baby from sin, and that baby didn't survive. But they went on to have another baby, another child that did survive. Because the big idea... I just made a long story short. I wish I could have read those, but we lost two-thirds of the sermon time. But God was able to bring another life and future. Because He can still use people who blow it, who have missed it, who have failed. Peter, you will deny me three before the cock, clo- cock crows three times. Everybody thinks he, it's like, you'll deny me three times before the cock crows in the morning. <laughs> I should say, cock, cock crows three times. Before the cock crows, <laughs> you'll deny me three times. He did. It did. And he went back to fishing. But the Lord brought him back and made him the great apostle to the Jewish people. And he is the one who preached the message to the thousands in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. What some call the birth of the New Testament church. He denied it. But he even said when he said, you'll do that, but when you come back to me, I will 
big idea today is God chose David, but he wasn't perfect. And he chooses you even though you're not perfect. So don't limit God. Give in to God. Yield to God. Accept the things, the opportunities, and the challenges that God has before you. The, the, the first part of this service was about just give the whatever part it is. If it's raising your hand, if it's clapping, if it's moving. Just whatever part. Start somewhere and give something and yield and see God move. Begin somewhere. And we need to start just saying, okay, God, I'm going to start rising up. I'm going to start witnessing. I'm going to start reaching out. I'm going to start praying for people that that I come across. I'm going to start believing for some things. I am expecting to see your promises fulfilled in my life. God chose David. He wasn't perfect. This was a royal mistake too. But God was able to use him because David repented go to uh, the one where you see um, pink yellow and red this is the difference between Saul and David because because uh, the prophet Nathan comes uh, the, the priest and the prophet Nathan comes to bring correction to David and tell him he's sinned and you know David's not real open to that obviously and Nathan was very careful and creative and he used a story and he got done telling the story and David was mad it says that David's anger was greatly aroused against the man in the object lesson that Nathan gave and he said to Nathan as the Lord lives the man who has done this shall surely die it was a it was a perfect illustration and he shall restore fourfold for the lamb because he did this thing and because he had no pity and Nathan said to David listen to this you are the man thus says the Lord God of Israel I anointed you king over Israel and I delivered you from the hand of Saul I gave you your master's house that's Saul's house and your master's wives into your keeping and gave you the house of Israel and Judah and if that had been too little I would also have given you much more God's way is so much better than our way why have you despised the commandment of the Lord to do this evil in his sight it goes on to Say how he killed Uriah and then drop your eyes down to that yellow. Well, just go to verse 10. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me. See, you left your first love and your worship of me and your passion for me and you looked at her and then to to cover your sin murdered an innocent man and took his wife as your own. In doing that, you despise me. That's where sin is. When we sin, we're really sinning against God. Even though when we sin, we sin against people and, and everything. It's, we're sinning ultimately against God. You see God saying that? Verse 12, For you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and the Son. And that was saying you're going to see the consequence of your sin. But here's the difference between David and Saul. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, the Lord also has put away your sin and you shall not die. This was a tremendous sin. But David truly repentant in his heart. It's more than just, I've sinned against the Lord. He didn't say, I've sinned against the Lord. He was overcome. There's no doubt. 
and with a truly contrite heart, maybe falling on his face, recognizing this to the Lord I've sinned. I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan, under God's leadership of the Spirit, says the Lord has put away your sin. Um, you go to the New Testament, you'll hear that God who was rich in mercy died for us. While we were still enemies, while we were ungodly, Christ died for us. When we were enemies of God, Christ shed His blood for us, Romans 5. He's rich in mercy, Ephesians 2. God gave David and so much so that it says um, I'm just going to read the yellow in the next two uh, or three slides I'm just going to read the highlights I took you from the sheepfold and from following the sheep to be ruler over my people and then drop down to the next thing where it says yellow also Lord tells you that He will make you a house. He will establish a house for you. Next slide, please. Drop down to the yellow. And your house, this house that will establish your house, and your kingdom shall be established forever before you. Your throne shall be established forever. God so forgave David and was able to use this imperfect person that He established a house for him that would go forever, eternity. Next slide, please. To the yellow again. And the Lord God will give him Jesus, the Messiah who is going to come. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom there will be no end. That's how God fulfills that. Jesus will rule. He is called the son of David. The guy who blew it. And the big idea today, i got to let you go. That's less than 30 minutes. <laughs> it is a little past. Gave them some good quality time to have their class. But I want you to leave here today saying if God could forgive David, who did? Not to mention the other wives. I, there's so much I can bring out in David's life. Which set the stage for Solomon. David's several wives <laughs> made it real easy for Solomon to have several hundred and seven hundred concubines. Three hundred wives and seven hundred concubines which was a big, big mistake. But God can use broken, imperfect, fallible people. Let's not judge ourselves and judge others by what we see. Don't look at your limitations. Look at the God who calls, who ordains, and who anoints. And if He has called you, He will equip you, and you can do whatever He sets before you the big idea. And David went down as the greatest king of Israel. Even though Solomon enlarged the kingdom to the largest Israel would ever have before the millennium. Um, David had it enlarged there, but it will, it will go and take all those other nations in, you know, in Solomon's reign. And it will be even bigger in the millennium. But I'm going to tell you something the greatest king of Israel. It's His throne that's established. And it's because of a heart of repentance and a worshipful person. He was a man who trusted in the Lord. He can do it for David. He can do it for you. Are you ready to go take on the world? There's two messages from David's life that says, I can do that. The first one makes us think, yeah, but I'm not David. Now, we all know that we have the Holy Spirit. We all know that God has called us, so we're anointed. We all are vessels of the Holy Spirit. We can see. 
the glory of God. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for challenging us. And may we live lives with demonstration, even as David, an imperfect person, but one you called and anointed. Even as he did it, we can see it happen in our lives too. We can face our giants, our bears, our lions. And we can even, in sorrowful hearts, get past our failures and see your promises come to pass. And we thank you for it. You, the one who are rich in mercy and have so much grace. And we give you praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen.